The Baal Shem Tov's innovation, we'll be celebrating his birthday soon, the Baal Shem Tov's innovation has been written up by Buber and by um, Shalom and, and of course they were writing as outsiders and they were they popularized the Baal Shem Tov. they didn't really explain him he championed the underdog he uh, fought for the simple Jew he found every Jew lovable he is so sweet that's not the Baal Shem Tov. First of all, the Baal Shem Tov was the scholar's scholar. He put everybody else to shame. His philosophy was so radically new and so profound that he never wrote down any of it. At most, he could present little glimpses. And it wasn't until two generations later that what he was teaching was finally understandable. Basically what he taught was there's something about God that you have no idea, you've never known, and there's something about you that you've never known. And it's time to reveal that secret. This is not Kabbalah. Kabbalah was known by then. Kabbalah was already available by then. Because a hundred years earlier, before the Baal Shem Tov, the Maharal of Prague was already teaching Kabbalah to his students. And before that, in Tzvas, the Ari had declared that it is now permissible for everyone to study Kabbalah. You don't have to be 40, you don't have to be a genius, and so on and so forth. So the Kabbalah was already available, and yet the Baal Shem Tov's teachings created such a revolution in, uh, in Eastern Europe that within two years, more than half the Jews of Europe were Hasidim. So what did he do? What was this great innovation? First, what did he say about God? that we didn't know before. He said, God is creating the world every moment. Because if he stopped creating the world for a moment, it would stop existing. Hundreds of volumes have been written on this philosophical, theological concept. The nature of the world because it came out of nothing, cannot exist on its own, because you can't teach nothing how to exist. So God makes it exist, and it can't continue, because it is essentially nothing. So God has to continuously make it exist. So when God said, let there be light, and there was light, you figure, okay, and then he moved on to another project, no. Since then, he is saying, let there be light every second. If he stops for a second, there's no light. If he stops for a second, there's no earth. There's no time. There's no space. There's nothing. Because nothing is the natural original state. So if there's going to be an existence, if there's going to be a world, he has to be telling it, forcing it to exist every moment. We say in the davening, God renews creation every day. That's an understatement. It's not every day. It's every moment of every day. It is more visible when the sun goes down and then it comes up again. That's a visible renewal. But essentially, the pen would not exist if God isn't telling it to exist. So God didn't create the world, he is creating the world. He is not a creator past, set, past tense, he is the creator present tense. Therefore, the Baal Shem Tov's conclusion was, there is 
specific divine providence, hashgacha pratit, for every detail of every creature, of every moment, of every event. What's the connection? If God has to tell the pen to exist right now, then does he know what's happening to the pen? How can he not? So constant creation is almost the same as divine providence. If he's telling it to exist right now, then he's conscious of it, he's aware of it, he's making it what it is. Baal Shem Tev gave an example. If a leaf falls off a tree in the autumn and a wind carries it from one side of the street to another, that was a divine plan. God planned and ordered the wind to carry the leaf and drop it right there. Because everything happens by divine providence. The amazing thing in that statement and, and the use of that, uh, that example is what the Baal Shemta was saying that, that the scholars of the day did not appreciate or understand. Of course, everybody believed in divine providence. Rambam speaks about it 800 years earlier or 500 years earlier. What the Baal Shemta was saying is like this. If God, this moment, decided that he doesn't want this table to exist anymore, and it disappears, what would happen to this cup? It would fall. If God said, I want this table to miraculously reappear up on the top of the, uh, where would the cup be? Huh? On the floor. <laughs> you assume the cup would end up where the table is, because it's on the table. Baal Shem Tov said, no, that's not true. That's a lack of belief in God. If God says this table should be up on the balcony, what made the cup end up on the balcony? Well, because it happened to be standing on the table. That's not kosher. If the cup ends up on the balcony, it's because God said that the cup should be on the balcony. Otherwise, the table can disappear and the cup will be right here. It won't even fall. Why would it fall? It wasn't told to fall. In other words, there is no cause and effect in nature. Scientists just discovered that last year. Okay, 10 years ago. There is no cause and effect in nature. There's only probable waves. So if the table disappears, what's going to happen to the cup? We don't know. It depends on what God wants for the cup. So the Baal Shem Tev said, if you believe that God created the world, and he created the seasons, and there's a season called autumn, and that's when the leaves fall off a tree, and God created the wind, and wind is stronger than a leaf, and God tells the wind to blow, well, of course the leaf is going to move. Oh, no. That means the wind moves the leaf. No. Only God moves a leaf. This woman said, they were sitting and talking, and one of the women said, uh, Oh, I have a daughter back home. She's five years old. And the other woman said, Yeah. I would have a five-year-old now, too, if I hadn't decided to have an abortion. So I said to her, excuse me, but it's not nice to play God. You're not God. What do you mean there would be a five-year-old girl here today, but she's not here because you decided to have an abortion? Who do you think you are? If the child was meant to be here, if there was supposed to be a five-year-old, there would be a five-year-old. Say, well, yeah, but I had an abortion. So what? Abortions kill? 
God decides who lives and who dies. Now, you shouldn't have made that decision. But don't tell me there would have been a five-year-old if you had not. In other words, a human life, a five-year-old girl, is not here today because you were stupid. No, that can't be. Can't be. So you have people who decide to have an abortion. They go in for the abortion and the child delivers a life. And then you have women who decide, no, I'm not going to have an abortion, and a week later they miscarry. So who runs the world? So what the Baal Shem Tov was saying is, not that God runs the world. Everybody knew that. What he was saying is, in God's world, nothing piggybacks. But God said, let the wind blow, so naturally the, the leaves were moved. No. God says the table should disappear. Well, the cup is going to fall. No. Everything has its own divine plan. And this will not move because of the table. Right? So there is no indirect effect in God's world. What, why is that so exciting? What's exciting is God is constantly busy creating the world and every detail in it over and over and over. Wouldn't it be much more efficient if he just made the world fly on automatic pilot? He's God. He could have said, let the world be and hang around till I tell you otherwise. Why does he have to constantly create it? In other words, he created the world in such a way that it will constantly be dependent on him and he's going to constantly have to be creating it. Why did he do that? The answer is, why did he create the world in the first place? Because he wants to have a relationship with his world. In fact, he wants a relationship that takes all his time and all his devotion. Constantly. So when we look at how God created the world, what we really see is the romantic side of God. What does he want? What is he after? He wants to create a world? Create it and then go on and do something else. No. He creates it, and he creates it, and he creates it. Because the purpose of creation is relationship. Coming on to uh, Yom Kippur, God, on his own initiative, picks a day out of the month of Tishrei and says, on the tenth day of this month, come to me and I will forgive you. We didn't ask him. We didn't petition. We did, nothing happened on that day to make it special. God picked a day and said, on this day, come, I'll forgive you. Do, do you... Are you romantic enough to appreciate this? Pesach, we came out of Egypt. Hanukkah, we found the oil. Purim, we ate a lot. What's Yom Kippur? God picks a day and says, please come to me, I want to forgive you. He wants to forgive us more than we want to be forgiven. That's what the Baal Shem Tov told us about God. 